Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, dear guests in the home and dear guests here in our wonderful Festsaal at the VU, I would like to welcome you to today's VU Matters VU Talks. It's a public discussion and tonight it's going to be on diversity, on equity and on inclusion. My name is Tatjana Opitz and I am the Vice Rector in charge of infrastructure and digitalization at this wonderful university and, as I always say, the one, most wonderful campus, at least in Europe, if not in the world. As part of VU Matters, VU Talks, a series of unique panel discussions and lectures, VU has created a platform which facilitates sharing of knowledge and insights between academia and public. The objective is to address economic and social issues and thus to contribute to the understanding of responsible and accountable economic action in order to solve economic, social, ecological challenges. Scientists, researchers and experts from the corporate world, as well as from public institutions, share their expertise on current issues with an interested public, and I'm sure all of you are very interested. I hope uh, that you are as much intrigued by the topic and uh, its underlying question. Is diverse the new normal of today's public discussion. I'm very much intrigued and, as I said, we are then very curious to hear your questions in the discussion. If anything, recent decades were marked by our society's realization um, of their own diversity. We are not as homogeneous, as identical, as we may have portrayed ourselves or believed us, or, or believed ourselves to be. And we are all the richer for it. Diversity fosters exchanges and growth. Today's challenges goes one step further, namely to ensure that this diversity is properly reflected in the way we live and in the way we work. In a nutshell, how can we ensure that our economic and public institutions properly reflect the markup of our society? That is, how do we make them diverse, equitable and inclusive? I would like to take the opportunity to thank VU Departments of Management for organizing the interesting panel discussion and welcome, of course, our guests uh, for tonight. Lulua Assad, Magdalena Christandl, Monika Fröhler, Barbara Liegel, and Ursula Struppe, who will share many valuable insights with us tonight. Let me also briefly introduce our hosts for the panel discussion. I will start with Professor Marie-Therese Klaas, the head of the Institute for Gender and Diversity in Organizations at VU, who focuses her research on international management, diversity and inclusion in organizations and female leadership. And Professor Jürgen Willems, the head of the Institute for Public Management and Governance at VU, whose research and teaching covers a variety of topics on citizen-state and citizen-society interactions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us for the discussion. Thank you here in the room and at home. And now I would like to ask Professor Klaas and Professor Willems to take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Tatiana, for this uh, introduction. So, um, indeed, this uh, uh, event of VU Matters, VU Talks, is organized by the Department of Management 
And uh, when Marie-Therese Klaas, who is a lead professor for gender and diversity in organizations, and I, so I'm professor for public management and governance, um, I think we only needed five minutes, ten minutes brainstorm to come up with this topic. And the reason was, if we just look at the last five years, um, how the debate on uh, diversity and inclusion has changed, um, we had to do a panel about it. So the, the, the reason is, if we just look at the last five years, um, what we see, there is stuff like... Um, Black Lives Matter, there is uh, the Me Too movement, and so on. And if you just look at it, um, these two or other, or, or other related elements, they caused actually that a lot of the debates went into an extra uh, gear, so that there was like an evaluation of debate on it, which is of course uh, a good element. But on the other hand, if you also look in the last five years, um, some elements from which we thought these are uh, achievements that we can take for granted, um, some of these elements, um, they were actually reversed. In some countries, some laws were uh, reversed. If we just look at the corona crisis, the very first weeks everyone was uh, telling, or there was a lot of research about it, that we went back into very old patterns, uh, that indeed we went back to, uh, to very typical um, gender roles in, in the household and so on. So things from which we thought these are actually achievements where no one anymore has to, uh, has to discuss about, suddenly uh, were again uh, there. And that's actually what we realized in a short brainstorm. So, um, and that's also why we have this title, like is, uh, is it the new normal, but we put it <laughs> the new in, uh, in, uh, in italic, because actually we think a lot of the debates are going on, but they are changing. And this changing, we need some expert input for that. And that's why we uh, today invited uh, five experts. And also there, marie Therese and I, we agreed quite quickly we wanted a broad uh, group of experts, so we didn't want just to focus on one particular element. Uh, we were thinking, like, who can say something about this? And we also decided to select people with um, a very, uh, let's say, practical background. Not only experts on one particular topic, but people with broad uh, experience in different organizations, in different settings, in different responsibilities. And that's also uh, what we asked them uh, to do. So we... Um, we gave them actually uh, three questions, and the assignment uh, for today was, uh, this is a university, that's why we have assignments. Um, so the assignment was just prepare three to five slides. Uh, just tell a little bit uh, where you coming from in this debate. So uh, what is your background, your organization, what do you stand for in this very broad debate, in this changing debate? And then we also, we want to ask these experts, what are currently, according to you, the challenges that we face? Not the challenges that we had 10 years ago, five years ago, or the challenges that we would still look at with a uh, traditional view. No, really, considering the last five years, they have been changing, so what are the challenges that we face? But also, these are experts, um, they have huge experience. Um, it's not that we suddenly are in front of a wall and we don't know how to climb it or in front of a mountain and we don't know how to get over it. Um, they are working in the field, in public organizations, in uh, civil society organizations. They know what is going on and that's also why we ask them, please give a small uh, sneak preview at what you think are the solutions uh, for the near future. Solutions they are working on, but also solutions that we could work uh, on, uh, so a little bit uh, policy agenda setting. So that is uh, the framing for today. And now uh, Marie-Therese will go over the uh, five speakers, give a little bit more information about their backgrounds, and then uh, every speaker will um, make this short statement. Uh, there are people following online. They can um, online ask questions, and I uh, or we can see them uh, on, our, uh, on our iPad, and um, we can also ask them to them later in the debate. Also, people in the audience, if you want to ask a question, uh, I will say when it's uh, more or less time, there is a microphone, so you can signal, you can go for a question, and then uh, that is also an option. But I will um, announce that again later. Yes, marie -Therese. Can I speak from here? Okay, thank you. So, um, it's my great pleasure and my honor and privilege to uh, um, welcome this wonderful panel that we are having, having here uh, tonight. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, the, uh, the different members of, of the panel so that we know where they come from a little bit. Yeah. So, um, Ms. Lulua Assad, yes, is here, uh, is um, 
interesting where she's working for. I had to look it up because I didn't know. The UN ODC. UN, okay, we know, we can guess, but the ODC. ODC is the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Right, and um, Ms. Assad is a criminal justice officer. So she coordinates the uh, UN ODC's Education for Justice initiative and uh, at the primary education level and manages a vast array of activities with UN, how do I say it? ODC, just UN ODC, ODC's mm -hmm. field offices, as well as activities under the UN ODC and UNESCO partnership on GCED for the rule of law. I mean, this is a lot of, you know, speak, uh, typical for these, uh, for these organizations, I guess. So, um, Ms. Assad provides advice and policy support on engagement with different innovative programs and stakeholders on the 2030 agenda, and that we all know. Yeah. Uh, as well as supporting countries in their education policy and innovative educational activities and models. So, uh, Lulua holds a master's degree in international relations, has served in the last 15 years many different positions at UN agencies and public and private sectors. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> then we have Ms. Magdalena Christandel, who is a project office, uh, who works at the project office Human Rights, Labour and Gender Equality. It's the Global Compact Network in Austria. And um, uh, this network is actually a business-led, uh, multi-stakeholder platform, right? So uh, they work directly with uh, businesses to help them implement the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact and advance the, sustainability, uh, the sustainable development goals. So it's um, local, regional uh, networking and uh, um, working with the, with the businesses, but also understanding uh, f what in business, what responsible business means within different national, cultural and language contexts. Yeah. So, interestingly, um, Ms. Um, Magdalena Christander is also representing of the youth in the Alps, and I found that actually fascinating. Um, so, discussion, the whole issues, uh, sustainability and, and environment, uh, relevant to the Alps, and introduction, the politics uh, for, for this, uh, these initiatives in the Alps. Uh, welcome uh, to you. Thank you for coming. There we have Ms. Uh, Monika Fröhler. Monika Fröhler, they're all very important people, as you can see, right? Uh, is CEO of the Ban Ki-moon Center for uh, Global Citizens. And is a passionate change maker, advocate, founder, and speaker. She was entrusted to create this Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens after working at the UN in Geneva, in New York, and in Vienna the EU, Austrian Foreign Ministry, and in field missions around the globe, a global trotter. She is passionate about the implementation of the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement. And throughout her career, she managed to support hundreds of women, young people, and communities all over the globe. For example, working in Africa, Latin America, to ban landmines, working to improve hospital care in rural Central Asia and Africa, assisting eco-friendly city planning in Asia, and bettering the living conditions of women in the Middle East and West Africa. So quite, you wonder how, can, how people manage to do all these things uh, in as young as they are, yes. Thank you, welcome. Uh, Ms. Barbara Legal is a, a political scientist and managing director of Zara. So when I hear Zara, I think of the clothing shop so I had to look it up as well, yes. But it is, it is Zara, uh, Civil Courage and Anti-Racismus Arbeit. Zara. Yeah. She, uh, this is, this is uh, an Austrian organization. Yeah. She also works at Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Fundamental and Human Rights, where she is responsible for the topic of asylum and migration, as well as inequalities and non-discrimination. 
She implemented EU anti-discrimination projects in Zagreb and Belgrade, which focused on cooperation with governmental and non-governmental institutions promoting equality and combating discrimination. Welcome. And then Ms. Ursula uh, Struppe, Head of Municipal Department Integration and Diversity in Vienna. Um, and for a number of years already, actually, yes, uh, since 2004. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Struppe studied theology and worked in the field of adult education until 99. And uh, after that, she uh, co-founded and coordinated an initiative against xenophobia, Land der Menschen, yeah. and worked with Executive City Councilor Renate Brauner in the field of integration here in, in Vienna, right? And uh, between 2001 and 2004. This work led to the foundation of the Municipal Department Integration and Diversity. Okay, thank you very much all for you. We are, uh, you know, fascinated by the richness of experience and knowledge that we have here. And we are very much looking forward to uh, your presentation, your small presentation about the homework, the assignment <laughs> that you got. <laughs> we'll start with the presentation of Lulua. Um, yes, it's working now. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. And uh, my name is uh, Lulua. And, um, I'm working at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. We cover various issues related, obviously, uh, to crime, uh, justice, organized crime, terrorism, prevention of violent extremism, as well as looking at uh, economic uh, crimes as well. And I'm really honored to be here today. And actually, when I got first the email from, uh, from the colleagues here at VU, I looked at it and thought, OK, so what can I say about this topic? It's such an important topic for me also. Um, at a personal level, um, as well being um, you know a woman coming from uh, Saudi Arabia, moving here to Austria, and also in terms of of my work and how um, this is also one of the driving also forces and engines for me while I'm working, of course, and serving the United Nations, and and I thought it would be good to also put things into perspectives at uh, as at the UN and what the Charter of the UN uh, means as well. Um, looking at obviously equity, diversity and, and inclusion and uh, here I just thought to put a little bit of context when I first started looking at what I want to say today and I thought that it would be important to remind all of us today that the United Nations was founded on the principles of uh, the dignity and worth of the human person and proclaiming the rights of everyone to enjoy all human rights and fundamental freedom without discrimination as to race, sex, language or religion. And of course, at the in the Charter of the UN, it is recognized that diversity, equity, inclusion also brings tangible benefits to the work of the organization, of course, to the benefit of member states and all stakeholders. And then taking a step back, of course, and reflecting now we are in 2022, in 2015, we adopted the Sustainable Development Agenda, and there was this, uh, there's this mantra for me in the Sustainable Development Agenda that is always like a, a reminder, which is basically leaving no one behind. So the entire Sustainable Development Agenda is very interconnected, so we cannot uh, achieve the goals SDG 4, for example, on education, while forgetting SDG 5 on gender equality, or SDG 10 on infrastructure, or SDG 16 on peace, justice and strong institutions and it's all about working together it's all about ensuring equity leaving no one behind and for not forgetting those who are vulnerable as well and of course the at utmost need of of uh, the support to actually be able to achieve the aspirations in the sustainable development agenda and for me here the link was to think about how can we translate this mantra which is leaving no one behind into policy into, uh, sorry, from policy into action. So these are all policies. But obviously from the work that I've been doing now at the UN, I've been managing various uh, programs and, and activities throughout the year. And um, I am not a subject matter expert on diversity or equity or inclusion, but this is part of the work that I do. And I'm very much um, inspired by this notion of leaving no one behind. How do we ensure reaching everyone? Um, how do we ensure inclusivity also in terms of program management in implementation? So rather in tangible terms. And um, what I wanted to also bring also today to the table is, is thinking that 
and reminding us all that development actually or sustainable development must be more equitable if it has to be sustainable. So we cannot have sustainable solutions without equity. And of course, it is a reality that there are deepened inequalities within and among countries and this threatens social progress, economic stability and reaching, of course, all of the sustainable development goals. Uh, but the entire agenda in itself is actually an agenda for equity. And I just wanted to invite us all here today to reflect, but what does the notion of leaving no one behind mean? For us, of course, at a personal level, but also as a, at a professional level, what can we do to achieve this notion? So this was also a sort of reflection that I was looking at when um, I was preparing my presentation. And I wanted to link it a little bit also so you know a little bit more about what uh, we do at you know, DC, but also, and then I will share some practical examples on showing how in terms of implementation there, there is a way to ensure that these notions and these um, uh, basically ideas are all reflected in the way we work. Uh, so right now we have launched the Global Resource for Anti-Corruption Education and Youth Empowerment, GRACE, and this was as a follow-up for a political declaration that was adopted at the UN General Assembly last year in June, uh, where there was a strong call to, um, to ensure quality education at the primary, secondary and tertiary like here today, education level, focusing on youth and the young generation. And of course, when we were developing this project and the whole idea, we needed to have four guiding principles. And um, the four guiding principles, and these are like our priorities. And here, when we were looking at the, at the managing, uh, management of this entire initiative and what it means for us, also building on the past experience that we've been working in this area of education, of developing uh, technical assistance projects upon request for member states working with NGOs, youth, academia, NGOs. So how, how does this translate, thinking about diversity, equity and inclusivity? And for us, there are four cross-cutting priorities and they are here on the screen. So they are youth, gender, innovation and partnerships. And I wanted to bring some examples that could demonstrate also these ideas that we've been speaking about. So one of the things here that I wanted to share, so I'll pick, uh, for example, gender. So gender for us is a cross-cutting priorities, um, um, ensuring also that we are empowering women in all of our activities, ensuring equal participation, and also mainstreaming a gender perspective into our work. And reflecting on that here also with my dear uh, colleague and, and friend, uh, Monica, and I still remember we were sitting down together and we thought, okay, we want to do something for women. Uh, we want to ensure that we are actually uh, ensuring diversity. We are reaching also women uh, that are at need to be supported, to be able to implement the sustainable uh, development agenda. And this is where we put our brains in, together and our teams and we thought we want to develop a woman empowerment program where this program will basically travel the world in different regions. And what do these women need at most? They need skills, leadership skills, they need training and they need also to be empowered to feel that they are not alone, you know, and that uh, we are there to support them through the tools, through our knowledge and expertise and also opportunities. And this is one of the more tangible ways where we wanted to translate this notion of diversity, equity, inclusivity by thinking about women and at the same time we wanted to ensure also this gender dimension as well and the role that men also play in the uh, notion which in the quest basically for women and the empowerment of women and how important it is to also mainstream this gender perspective into the, our work. So this is one of the ways where we work together of course thinking about these ideas basically and then um, and I thought also about the other things that we've been doing and this was part of the homework so when we're looking at youth uh, youth is one of our cross-cutting priorities why because the world today is home for 1.8 billion youth worldwide and this number of course is increasing and um, and here at uh, our grace initiative actually in fact we launched a youth-led uh, integrity advisory board where we brought 25 youth from all over the world together to serve as our advisors, to give us advice on how do we implement our projects, how do we ensure that the projects that are targeting youth are actually designed by youth, that their perspectives are heard, their voices are heard, so they are not just recipients at the end, but they are also designers and they are involved. And while we were looking at this, and then we, with the team we thought, okay, but 
we want to ensure that we are leaving no one behind. What about disabilities? We want to also find youth that have disabilities because we want to ensure that we are empowering everyone, that we are also involving everyone in this in the design and in this machinery of implementation on the ground. And here, this was one of the, um, actually, this is something I'm really proud of with the team, that here is also another example of how we can ensure diversity and also bringing everyone to the, to the implementation, obviously, of the sustainable development agenda. Um, again, when it comes to innovation and partnerships, and this is my last uh, slide. Um, so with partnerships, again, we were in a situation where we, we have all of these tools that were developed. We developed them in consultation with different partners. We ensured that they address the issues of diversity, of inclusivity, of equity. Uh, but at a certain point, we thought, okay, so we're working with the formal education sector and we were discussing with the team, but what can we do? We want to ensure leaving no one behind. What about refugees? Can't we just use these tools, etc.? What can we do? We need partners. And this is why partnerships is key also, if we want to uphold also these notions. And this is where we reached out to UNRWA. We said, we have, these pro we have these tools. We would like to partner with you. We want to work closer with you. We want to train the teachers in the refugee camps. We want to reach the children and the you and youth. And again, this also shows this power of, you know, uh, partnerships. So I just wanted to share some tangible experiences on how these ideas could be part of, you know, the way we work, our modus operandi, and how we could actually make a sustainable impact. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Shall we move on then to yes. Magdalena? Yes. So thank you for inviting me and for the introduction. I would just uh, add something because you said I'm representing the youth and I'm coming from the ecological background. Um, so I was working there some years and then I found out that also sustainability, it's not like inclusive because it's really uh, cost. I mean, there are a lot, if you really would like to, to live sustainable, you need to, to have money. You need to have more time to travel by train. So I really found out, okay, if uh, we need more, if, if, if you see like all the 70s, uh, 70 uh, sustainable development goals, you, you need to think, okay, how can we achieve all of them? And uh, so that's why I moved from ecological to the social dimension of sustainability. And uh, that's why I'm working now at the Global Compact Network in Indiana. And uh, we are also part of the UN family. And um, so the UN Global Compact is like, um, there are like 70 um, network all over the planet with almost 20,000 participants. And we are trying with, with those participants to reach the sustainable uh, development goals. Um, and one of the goals is, is the SDG 5, the gender equality. Um, and I'm working on, th on that um, and also on, on human rights in the supply chain. And uh, on, like every day I find out that the women are like the vulnerable group. We need to protect them and we need to help them to, um, yeah, to reach the same things like men already reached years ago. Um, and that's what I'm... Um, but so it's really important for me to this equality between the genders and also like uh, also to other groups. So um, for me, there are a lot of challenges in here. Um, my, the first challenge is the gender pay gap. I mean, Austria is on position 25 out of 27 and at the EU level. That means that uh, the difference between the um, the average income between men and women is like 20%. I mean, 20% is one, it's, it's crazy, it's a crazy number. So uh, we really need to work on that. Um, and uh, companies are trying, uh, they are still just on the beginning, I would say. So they try to, to bring up like young professionals in, in the talent pipeline and to train them and to, and to, and to train them for, for the higher positions because in the next years we will have a shortage of talents because all the boomer generations, they're retiring. But right now we have not enough uh, professionals and not enough uh, female professionals they are ready to go to these positions because in the last years we did not train them and we did not have faith enough to say, okay, you are next. Um, and we have also these male-dominated professions and these female-dominated uh, professions. 
And the same thing with the generations. Um, not, if we could mix all of these uh, things together, we would have such a high potential um, to work on. Um, and also a big challenge that I see is the education, um, even the higher education. A lot of people have no access to higher education and also here, the girls and the women, they're like not, they not allowed to go to school in a lot of places in the world, and it's really hard for them to study. And even if, they're, if they studied and if they worked, like just today, I, I was in a call with the ILO, with the International Labour Organization, and there's a new report, and the, they found out that 20% of all women, they cannot go back to work after they, they had a child because they, they need to take all the care work. So every day, a woman in average they are working four hours and 35 minutes for free just at home and they say that's like the uh, the highest challenge for them to, to do both to do the care work and to go to a real work um, so what's the solution I, I mean that's pretty hard um, so what I can say from my daily work with the companies um, I think I mean, it's a long process, and I think we are not even on the halfway uh, of it. Um, but still, there are some steps we already did, and, uh, but even more to go. Um, and as I'm trying, or also we as a network, we are trying just to, to use uh, the gender-neutral uh, language every day. We try to share the good experiences and the good practices and the good alternatives. And if it's just like the small steps, like mentorships or like job shadowing or part-time solutions, there are like solutions for some of some of us. Um, and using this data, as I'm doing, uh, just some people like uh, numbers, and with data we have numbers. We can say, look, if you have like. Uh, a diverse team, you have like um, this and this uh, more percent of success. I mean, that's, that's reports we have already here. Uh, we just need to, to ta take them in, into account and um, use them for our companies as well. Um, what I, I mean, I'm working with the companies and they ask me, what can we do that we have more women in higher positions? And then mostly I'm just sitting there with women. <laughs> I mean, the CEO is saying, okay, do something, and then I'm sitting there with some women. I was like, okay, if we talk about such uh, questions, we need to invite everybody. We need to invite all genders uh, from all levels and from all departments and, this, and to talk about together. It doesn't make sense if it's just, okay, that's some women-related thing, just go there. It's, it, that's not going to change something if it's not coming from, from the CEO and from the whole company um, all together. And that's lead me to the next thing. A lot of companies, they already had, have policies and guidelines, but just they're like written and lying somewhere. But in the daily life, in the, in, but uh, like the workers are working, but they have never read these guidelines and they don't know how can I use gender neutral languages. So you need to train them. You need to say, okay, look, here is the training and we really would like to, to inform you about what we are standing for. But in the first uh, point, we, they need to defi define, okay, what we are standing for. Um, and uh, policies, uh, I mean, right now, also on the EU level, there is going on a lot, um, and that's pretty good. We have the new due diligence and law, it's going from soft law to hard law. We have the new EU taxonomy with the social dimension. We have the new UN guiding principles on business and human rights. We have also the new ILO declaration. Um, and what we really have, and that's really, but I think it's a really good step, uh, we have the Global Reporting Initiative. They, they took into account the social dimension on, this, on the standards. So every company needs to define uh, and to tell what they are doing to achieve more gender balance and also more diversity. And uh, they cannot say, mm, no, I don't know. They really need to write down what they are doing and if it's... Uh, like what's their status quo right now. And what we also need, we need like uh, wage transparency um, and we need that every company has a diversity strategy um, and we need to raise awareness on these things because a lot of people never thought about things like that. A lot of people don't know that they are not earning the same uh, income than their like other men or other women. So we need to be more open and we need to speak more about it. And that's why I'm really happy that I'm here today to speak about it. Thank you.
Ms. Fröhler? Gladly. Uh, dear audience, kudos to you that you're coming out in the evening for diversity, equity and inclusion. I'm the CEO of the Ban Ki-moon Center. These three themes are key to what we do. Maybe in the name you can guess global citizenship entails exactly these concepts. And I'm wondering if we're looking at the crisis that the world currently is facing together. One of the major crises that we see right now very imminent is the Ukraine war. Another crisis lingering on definitely are other conflicts. We shouldn't forget Syria, we shouldn't forget Yemen, we shouldn't forget the many places in the world that are currently struggling. Another major one that we can't deny for our generations or the ones to come is climate. There is yet another one for the economy. It is stretched. We will have problems of shrinking economic power, maybe exploding in other fields. Can we solve any of these problems without more diversity, without true equity, and without more inclusion? I would like to ask you to raise your hand if you believe that we can solve any of these. Raise your hand if you believe that we can only solve it when we have more of all of it. Okay, so actually we are all on the same page. Let me tell you what the Ban Ki-moon Center tries to do in this effort. We have identified that these major crises, of course, can only be solved in collaboration. You will see on the slide a picture of go back one, you see climate depicted by polluted ocean shores, you see uh, workers that do not get a fair wage, many of them women, many of them underage. You do see a health worker who is breaking down because of the, of the burden of COVID, and you see um, a crowd demonstrating because there is inequity. Next slide. So how do we try to tackle these challenges, being the small unit of the Ban Ki-moon Center, the former Secretary General of the UN that we are? We said we do need a world that is more inclusive, more equitable, more diverse, and we want to work for that. How do we do it? We have identified there is a lack of leadership. So at highest level, we have a lack of leaders who really truly do what the documents are preaching. Too few that are global citizens who have the mindset of exactly standing up for these rights, these values. We need more leaders who are true global citizens and not only national leaders who say my country first without naming names. Secondly, there are, there's a lack of opportunities for young change makers to rise to the challenge and do something about it. And third, we believe that Yes, many are working in silos and the sectors are not necessarily working hand in hand and that sometimes sounds like a cumbersome and quite abstract notion, but it's a fact. People are not working in collaboration. Next slide. So the SDGs are known and please give me a show of hands. Every one of you has studied or knows the SDGs, I guess. So everyone who knows them, hand up. You know that it's the world governmental program. You know it's the best that we have so far. They are valid until 2030, you know all of that. I find this distinction quite interesting because the SDGs, yes, they create the conditions in the biosphere that make our planet worth living and keep it worth living, sustainable. They have the societal aspects and of course also the economic aspects and all can only be achieved in partnership. What, what I do like about this donut depiction is if you put together with me the lens of equity, on it. We immediately see there is no, unfortunately, no equity anywhere. If you start with partnerships, no. Biosphere, no. If you put the lens of diversity on it, unfortunately, again, we haven't reached our targets there. So what does it mean? Next slide. Um, we are trying to make an impact with concrete things. And let me tell you what these concrete things are. For the high, high leaders, for those that we can reach via Ban Ki-moon and also our co-chair, Dr. Heinz Fischer, who is the former president of Austria, we manage to push and pull for the SDGs and for Paris climate to do more. That's 
let's say, 60% of our work. We focus a lot on climate, on adaptation, because we believe that adaptation to the new conditions that are already out there is necessary, particularly in agriculture. Food systems are at the brink of breaking down. Those that bear the brunt of the burden are smallholder farmers in the first instance, and then later on the rest. Smallholder farmers are many women, of course also youngsters who are trying to make a living from that, and they are cut off from the decision-making tables. So we are really deeply engaging in agricultural adaptation, with Ban Ki-moon leading the effort. We are also trying to get SDG knowledge and Paris Climate Agreement knowledge into all education worldwide, primary, secondary, tertiary. And we are trying to assist governments who say, I want to become better on the SDGs. Well, how can we do that? We try to assist them. Very concretely, in the case of Austria, they have turned to us and we are in a multi-stakeholder process in that regard. Austria is ranking sixth. And now this slide illustrates, still that, illustrates what we do with young changemakers, because that's just one side of the coin, the leadership. The other side of the coin is the young changemakers that need to be trained and rise to the global citizen kind of mindset and exactly what Lulua has said before, feel empowered. So what we do is we train them in fellowships, in scholarships, in mentorship programs, provide them with input so that they can become the change that they would want to see in the world. You know that quote probably. They implement SDG microprojects and these SDG microprojects, they are relevant for their community, range across the SDGs, and we have reached with them in the meantime 730,000 people. We trained about 200, about 150 uh, microprojects, we even account for, for more, 170 microprojects are now on the road globally, in Africa, Latin America, Middle East, Europe, Asia. We have reached a lot of people. Is it enough to ensure the diversity that is needed at the decision-making tables? Unfortunately, not yet. Is it enough to have reached true equity? Not yet. Are we trying to do our share to be as inclusive as possible and include marginalized? We are trying. Do we have a long way to go? Definitely. But I would encourage you, and I will close with that, I would encourage you to take your own passion, become a change maker. There is no, no limit to how small you can start. If you start small, it will eventually grow. And that's our appeal to our scholars and mentees and fellows as well. Teaspoons of change make a huge difference. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, we now move on to Ms. Liga. Thank you very much. I feel very honored to be here with you on this panel, as there are many organizations working globally and um, also uh, the Department on Diversity and Integration of the, of the City of Vienna is much bigger than our organization is. We are an anti-racism NGO which is based in Vienna. And um, the aim of our organization is to promote respectful interaction, both online and offline, um, to promote a society which is critical of racism and a society which um, shows civil courage, especially when they witness racism. So we offer legal and psychosocial support to people who experience racism and to people who experience or witness online hate. And um, actually one of our counseling units which focuses on, on racism is funded by uh, the city of Vienna by, uh, by the department of, of Ms. Stuppe. And um, when people report racism to our organization, uh, we, first of all, offer them uh, psychosocial su support so that uh, they can talk about what they have experienced. And then our counselors, together uh, with the people that turn to us, um, develop a strategy on how they can go forward to either gain access to justice or if there is no legal possibility um, to 
maybe have mediation talks uh, with with the people that uh, discriminated the person or um, that our organization writes a letter of intervention asking um, the, the the people that have discriminated against our client or uh, that have um, or the organization that has discriminated against our client um, to explain why why they they did that we explain why uh, this is discriminatory and we also uh, sometimes offer advice on how to overcome uh, this kind of discrimination and um, we document all these cases of racism and I think it is very important that uh, we we document these cases and that we also uh, publish uh, some of the the cases we document so that there is evidence around about uh, racism in Austria because there are not much official data sources on on, on racism in Austria um, we also use uh, the work we, we do in counseling as a basis for our educational work we do and also for uh, the public relations and awareness raising work we do and we are also involved in many different uh, projects which um, support our, our values and um, we also try, based on the reports we get, uh, to see where are the major issues of racism within our society and what could maybe be done in a preventive way um, to make it possible for, for people not to experience the same uh, kind of discrimination over and over again. Although we see that many of the clients that turn to our organ organization have already experienced racism for quite a long time and have, have experienced uh, many um, incidents of racism. And um, as I already said, we, we also make public some of the, of the cases we document. We publish the racism report each year which shows some of the examples of the incidents that are reported to us and um, actually we present this report next Monday which is the International Day for the Elimination of Racist Discrimination. So where I'm coming from is that um, I have a very strong focus on, on the issue of racism um, our organization sees um, ourselves as an ally for people who experience racism and when we were established in 1999 it was not very common knowledge in our society that there are many people that experience this everyday um, racism and that people that are labeled as different by, by society are actually not really safe anywhere but can experience racism in all kinds of situations they can experience it at home uh, when they when they have neighbors that are racist or they experience it at the place of work or when they go to the doctors or at school so uh, you are not really safe anywhere and this the reason for that is that Racism is actually a structure and ideology uh, that um, is embedded in, in all our organizations, in all our structures, in, in all kinds of, of legal provisions. And um, I think this, uh, this discussion on, on structural racism um, got more visibility in 2020 when Black Lives Matter um, became stronger and actually also um, the different societies in Europe had to deal with with this issue of structural racism and had to reflect on on white privilege and on what we as white people contribute to this uh, to this system um, of racism um, and um, of course it is also not so easy for our organization as we are actually also part of this system of racism um, to think about how we as an organization can 
overcome this system within our organization and support uh, people that uh, experience this kind of racism every day um, in, in getting support from us. So, of course, diversity is also an, an issue which we, within our organization, have to deal with. Um, but we also see, on top of structural racism, we also see when we deal with public institutions um, that there is institutional racism around. So, as we are all socialized within the system of racism, we, of course, are influenced it, uh, in our way of thinking and um, in, in how we act. So, many of the people that report racism to us uh, face um, racist situations with public institutions like the, the police or uh, with institutions that um, are responsible for social services. Um, so we see that um, within, within these institutions, people very often revert to racist knowledge that is generated within our society, but also within uh, institutions um, to, deal, uh, to deal with, with clients. And um, especially, and um, I thought this was very interesting because uh, this is a study that um, has recently been published in Germany, um, that people especially revert to this racist knowledge when they are very insecure in what, in what they do and how they can handle certain situations. So for me, uh, the major challenge when we look into all kinds of different concepts of, of diversity and diversity policies um, is how can uh, all these measures really contribute to overcoming this structural racism and institutional racism. And I very often ask myself the question whether uh, the measures that are currently taken are really um, supporting um, us to um, kind of um, really get to the roots of, of the system and to really change the system which has established uh, very unequal power relations and I think it is always uh, very difficult to overcome uh, well-established power uh, relations because uh, there are always people around that are of course afraid of losing power. So uh, the question is how can all these diversity strategies and um, measures, especially in public institutions that really try hard to um, offer good services to a very diverse population and a population that this is becoming uh, more heterogeneous every day. Um, so I think we really have to look into structural and institutional racism and make it, make it visible and um, really make people aware of what uh, structural and institutional racism mean and what kind of impact they have on, on people affected by it. And I think we also really have to talk about and make very uh, visible these unequal power relations so that especially we as, as white people become aware of all the privileges we have in the system and how we can also make use of these privileges to change this, this system of, of racism. And um, I think we actually have to actively unlearn racist attitudes and, and thinking and strategies and actions, which is of course not, not very easy as we have all uh, grown up within these structures. And as, I'm, as we are currently at the university here, I think it is also very important that there is uh, more research done on how structural and institutional racism um, and diversity interact with each other and affect each other. Um, and I think uh, that uh, it is really important to do more qualitative uh, research in, in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Many, many thanks already. So, Mr. Struppe, um, you're the last one. Uh, 
thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, after these inspiring uh, inputs from the international perspective, uh, I think my job here is to bring you down back to the little world of Vienna, to the local level. Um, uh, I'm head of the city department for integration and diversity. We are about 55 uh, uh, persons uh, speaking many different languages, uh, being born in many different countries. Uh, and since we are here at the EU, I mention always just to give you a, an idea of the dimension, we have a funding budget of uh, around 8 million euro, 8, 9 million euro. And we are plus our kind of working budget for, for uh, yeah. But, so we are a very small city department. Um, our name is what we are supposed to do. We are uh, supposed to uh, care for integration, uh, which a term which I don't especially like because I think it's misleading in many ways. But um, integration in the, in the sense of helping people coming to Vienna to get a good start in Vienna. We have a program uh, Start Wien, Start Vienna. Uh, which uh, includes all the classical things like uh, uh, learning the language, uh, getting a job, uh, finding first orientation about the health system, education system, and, and all of that. That's a one, one part integration, but the other part is diversity, meaning um, it's, not, it's not just enough to, to uh, help people, help the newcomers to, to find their their, their way around here, but it also needs a lot of work to, to frame the picture the Viennese make themselves uh, of their own city, because um, it's a diverse city, and this is what I want to show you a little bit more, and the, the sensibilization work, the diversity management within the public institutions within the city of Vienna, is in a way much more uh, demanding or in a way much more difficult than the work with the newcomers itself. Um, so I brought some, some facts and figures about uh, Vienna. Uh, we have uh, about 1.3 million Austrian nationals and about 600,000 foreign nationals. It's 178 different nationalities. I mean, you are the experts, maybe I'm wrong at this point, but I think there are only 16 nations missing to form a uh, UN assembly. So we are quite an international city in a much broader sense than many Viennese would think. Uh, among the Austrian Passport owners are those born in Austria and those born abroad. And among the foreign nationals are those born in Vienna we have, uh, and, and uh, born in Austria. We have almost 100,000 persons with a foreign passport but being born in Vienna. So many second generation kids are born in Vienna. And those persons of foreign origin are 41.9, meaning born abroad and or having another passport. And most of those who are foreigners, foreign nationals, are living for a long time in Vienna. Uh, if, you, if you see the, the figures, they're almost 82% living more than five years but a lot of them living more than 10 years. So the, in a legal sense, they are foreigners, but in the way they are <laughs> feeling and, and living, they, they, they are Viennese, and, and as the city of Vienna considers them as being Viennese population, Viennese citizens, no matter if they have an Austrian passport or another passport. Of course, Vienna is also the own, a very young, the, young, the, the youngest uh, Bundesland of Austria. Uh, but if you look, if you see at the, at the colors, 
the younger the people are, the more they diverse. So our schools, our kindergartens, our universities are, are, are full with persons with an international biography, with parents, grandparents, uh, or themselves born some, some place or another. Uh, which means also that, not, uh, that our institutions, our schools, our, 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 our systems uh, are not quite adapted to this reality. It's not something which is, if you, if you think about uh, formation of teachers, for example, they, they, you still have the idea they, they prepare themselves of teaching Meyers and Müllers, <laughs> but the Viennese uh, school and the Viennese class is not Meyer and Müller anymore, and in a way it never was. It's a, it's a fiction some Viennese have in their heads, but it was never, it was never ever in the city of Vienna uh, like that. So, uh, and then one of our main problems, and I want to uh, uh, kind of conclude with that, that we have a major democratic uh, deficit and a major problem of, of participation. Uh, more than 40% of every single uh, year between 25 and 45, more than 40% are not allowed to vote in Vienna. Which means, yeah, which, which means a lot, which means that politicians usually tend to uh, want support and, and uh, uh, approval of those who can vote them because that's what, you know, that's what their job is all about, getting elected. Uh, and if but you wouldn't, you, I mean, it's not in general, there are many, but in a way, it, it, it's a tendency if, you, if you, 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 you work for people who vote you. And for the, not for those 40 percent who can't, you're not allowed to vote. Um, and on the other hand, it makes something with, with, with you not being allowed to vote. If, if you're born in Vienna, spend your uh, life in Vienna, we have many, many young people, and they are 18 or 19, but they're not allowed to vote. And of course, that makes a distance between you and the, and the political system, between you and and, and to government, also administration. So there's something we have a lot, a lot to do. Of, of course, you can do it. You can change uh, the law concerning who, uh, who is allowed to, to vote. But you can also, which is even much more important, I guess, you have to, to change the the, 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 the very hard limits of who can get a citizen. Like if you're born in Vienna, you, you should have an easier access and all, all of those things. Think about double citizenship, which is possible in a greater degree in almost every other European land and country than in Austria. So there's a lot of doing this in this very serious democratic uh, problem. We are running into, a, we've been running into it for a long time now. And yeah, thank you for the moment. Okay, thank you very, very much. That was an enormous input, uh, very diverse. And uh, I think very rich. We all got uh, plenty, plenty of ideas. I'm not sure um, how much time we have left anyway. Like, uh, half an hour or something. And half I first an want hour. to see again, uh, people uh, at home online, yeah. you are very welcome to ask questions also in the audience. Also uh, in the if audience. you want to ask a question, so uh, wave before, and then we can yeah. have a spot there. And we still have about half an hour um, right. for Because, I, I mean, personally, I would have a lot of questions already, but I don't want to uh, monopolize it. So. Shall we start with you? Any question? Any comment? There is yes. a microphone there, so then we don't. Please have go to, to the microphone. Should I switch?
switch it on? It works. Uh -huh. Hi. Uh, I'm a doctorate student here at VU and for, in East, at Institute for that, uh, Gender and Diversity. And I would like to ask Barbara one question. Uh, do you have any data on uh, work discrimination and do you have any data on uh, so-called uh, subtle discrimination and incivilities? And are those data, if you have it, I, I suppose that you do, are those data available for research for students, for example, <laughs> doctorate students? Well, we, of course, have a database for um, our counselors. So uh, the focus of the entries is that uh, the counselors can work well with, with the database. But of course, at the end of each year, we um, analyze the data for the racism report, which we publish annually. So you can find examples of the cases in, in this report, um, all, the, all the reports, and I think this year it is the 22nd report we are publishing. Um, so you can find examples there. Um, as for the database itself, it is difficult because, of course, uh, the data in there is not anonymized. Um, so it is um, kind of difficult for, for us or a lot of work for us to anonymize the data so that it is um, accessible for research. Uh, but um, maybe we can, if, if you have concrete questions, then maybe yes. we, can, yes. we can look into it. You, um, you can give me your email address and we can... Thank you. <laughs> uh, we can, of course, talk, talk about it. And we, we divide um, the cases into um, different areas of living. So one area of living is actually uh, work. And, but, uh, I mean, we, we, we are not the only organization uh, that deals with, uh, with uh, racism at work. There is also the Ombud for Equal Treatment. Um, they publish, I think, a report um, biannually, uh, which is submitted to Parliament. And um, there are also examples of, of, of their cases in, in this report. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other burning questions? Or comments so far? Yes, please. Andrea. Yes. yes, please. But while you go there, I will also ask my question, and then we don't have right. <laughs> to wait so long. So um, um, I, I also checked all the presentations. I also checked uh, your background, and I saw all of you have a, a lot of experience in education, uh, or you worked in it, or you're now, as a part of your program, trying to create awareness. Um, but I think we, as a university, also have to be honest. A lot of these programs, they are outside universities. They are extra programs that you organize. It's extra workshops. So it's more called non-formal education. Um, so my question is a little bit, and you can be critical, um, what is it that we maybe do not do enough well at universities? What is missing um, in teaching and in research? So I think that's a, a question quite open. I think we do a lot, but sometimes yeah, we as researchers, we're focused on, on publications in our ivory tower. So uh, how can you help us steer better again at the questions that matter. Anybody would like to start answering? Being critical? Well, go ahead. Not critical, but at the end of the day, students study to get a job, to enter the job market. To study something that is relevant for the job is a given. So I think programs that are actually conducted by the UN and also we do stuff like that, where research is tailor-made to problems that already occur in everyday life, are the ideal kind of bridge between, I'd say, academia and the public sector. This is at least what I sense. And we are doing that. There is a program called ROUN. It's the Regional Academy for the United Nations. And it's entities of the UN, including UNODC, including... Well, the Ban Ki-moon Center is a, a sort of affiliated to the UN, where we pose concrete research questions to young change makers and say, what, for example, has been the impact of lockdowns on domestic violence in specific countries? There is hardly anything scientific out there. What can you tell us about it? And the researchers go into that subject matter and enrich the thing 
what can universities do better? Um, to be practically relevant for policy decision makers, that's what universities do, but it's often, it's often a question of linking to the decision makers and being more proactive there, taking ownership, um, asking people, like knocking on doors, getting relationships going. That is something that I think has a long way to go. Thank you. Um, yes. No, I think also part, of, um, also to complement what Monica was saying, is uh, basically for us, higher academic institutions, they play a very important role in achieving the sustainable development agenda. And that's very, you know, clear and, 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 uh, um, and you know, um, it's, it's, I don't have to go into that direction. Uh, but what is also really interesting is when we speak about research, because I've, I've, I've been also coordinating a lot of research projects and grant, research grants for also young scholars, is um, when it comes to these issues that are related, for example, to specific, uh, you know, let's say, let's pick SDG 16, because this is uh, the biggest part of my work. I notice also that uh, research, for example, is very prominent in certain languages. And I think also to ensure diversity, we need to have more research conducted in uh, different languages because this brings a completely different perspective. It allows also young uh, scholars from different parts of the world to be engaged in research, to be able to actually contribute. And, uh, and also speaking of having uh, sectors work together so we don't work in silos and building partnerships, it's also for, uh, to see more of this, um, let's say, um, um, you know, um, proactivity also from the academic side because a lot of academic research, speci especially evidence-based research, can inform a lot policy reform, legislations, and these are all very important issues when it comes obviously to implementing the uh, sustainable development agenda. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, um, I think... Did you, did you want to say that? Huh? <laughs> um, um, I think um, what is really important is um, more interdisciplinary research, um, more participatory research, and um, also what my colleagues were talking about, this practice orientation. Um, I, I also work at the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Fundamental and Human Rights, and we try very hard um, at implementing a kind of translational research cycle uh, where we, um, first of all, do, do research and then try to come up with recommendations which uh, should then, of course, be implemented by somebody and then really return after like um, a year and look into whether these uh, recommendations have been implemented um, and it, it is a very theoretical issue because um, it is very difficult to get funding for this kind of, um, of research. But I think it, it would really be, uh, be very rewarding because then we as researchers would also see what kind of impact we, we have when we, when we come up with recommendations targeting um, the administration or, or other decision makers. So I think this, this would also be uh, very important. And I think especially in these areas we are talking about today. Okay, thank you. So I remember uh, practice uh, proactive and interdisciplinary. So we'll work on it from tomorrow on. <laughs> um, there's a question from Andrea. Andrea. Thank you very much. Um, I also work here at the university. I'm assistant professor in gender and diversity. I'm uh, actually, I agree with you, with some of you who have said that we need more research, but of course a lot of support as well from uh, intergovernmental organizations and, you know, the uh, organizations that are closer to those who are making the decisions and are actually making changes uh, with regard to inclusivity and, and, and diversity. Other than that, I would like to ask a question to Ms. Um, Monica. Uh, I'm sorry, to Barbara. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm interested in, in, in this that you mentioned, that you offer certain uh, counseling to individuals who have been experiencing res racism here in Vienna. Um, is it that this counseling is also offered, as it was mentioned before, the, the topic of language, in different languages, or at least it is accessible in English, which is the language that probably most foreigners here in Austria dominate? Uh, we have um, counselors who speak different languages, 
Um, currently, I think it's Romanian, um, French, English, um, Turkish. But of course, um, we are 16 staff members, most of us part time, and six staff members are counselors. Uh, so we can only cover a very limited spectrum. And when we remember what you said about the population in Vienna, it is really very diverse. Um, and we, we try to gain access to interpretation services, uh, which has become a bit easier during the last years because um, it is also um, offered um, via online tools. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, that's always also a question of, of, of funding. And um, sometimes it's, it's also the case that uh, clients uh, bring people along that, that uh, do interpretation for, for them, which is of course not the best uh, solution. But um, if we cannot find another way of doing it, then uh, this, is, this is the solution. Thank you. And the last question is for uh, Mrs. Struppe. I was quite shocked <laughs> by one of your last slides. Um, so if I'm understanding clearly, uh, that means that there is a high number of people, we are talking about 40% between 25 and 45, that are really not choosing their politicians that are representing them in here, right? So that's, that's something that <laughs> really leads to a lot of of thinking of what the repercussions and what are the effects of not being represented and how that impacts diversity as well, right? Because these are diverse people who may have a, a lot of inclusion and diverse ideas that are not really you know, represented or, or heard by the politicians here. So that was quite shocking and yeah, I wanted to know a little bit more about what you think about these, these repercussions and, and how this is affecting this 40% of the people that you just mentioned. Thank you very much. Well, I'm happy I could shock you. <laughs> that's, what's in, that's, that's what I intended because I think it's, it's uh, for, for so, so, many, so many times we talk about uh, diversity and nice and culture and, and all of that. But in the but in the in the hard facts, who decides, who votes? It's it's a total 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 different picture. It's not it's it's just just very. It's it's not something you can you can uh, uh, make make look nice or be hübsch. It's, it's just reality. Are you entitled to vote or are you not entitled to vote? And this makes something with you in your mindset. It's not just uh, well, one one or less vote doesn't matter. It it makes something with a young guy or young girl in Vienna not being allowed to vote. And all the others, I mean, all the others. There are so many others in the class because um, <laughs> if you if you go down to let's say 16, when they can start to vote, it's much. It's even higher than with 48. So many young kids in Viennese schools. They have a uh, political uh, education that's supposed to get them. When you, but you, are, you stand the teacher in a class and you have half of the class who say, well, you can talk to me about election and, and participation in political process and all of this, but it's not for me. So I, th I think we should talk, uh, talk and think more about it because it's, it's so often it's, it's a... It's a, it's a political thing about uh, double citizenship or, or voting rights for third country nationals and it's, it's kind of stuck in those political, uh, <laughs> which, which doesn't get to some constructive uh, discussion or dispute about it, uh, what it means. It's, yeah. Thank you that I could shock you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Yes, please. Anyone? Any online? 
Uh, no. Okay. for your very interesting uh, presentation and your inspiring Speak words. into the microphone, oh, Okay. Please. So, uh, can you hear me better? Yes. yes well, thank you very much for your inspiring work and interesting presentation. I have a question to Mrs. Fröhler. So, you mentioned the 17 SDGs, and I was just wondering, do you think that these are all the topics that are covered, or should there maybe be more <laughs> the SDGs, perhaps? Super question. Um, the SDGs, as you know, are valid until 2030. And I hope that many of them can come close to fulfillment. Is it very likely with the current crisis that are going on? Is it very likely with the finances that are poured into it? No. As a personal perspective, what I currently don't see reflected to the extent that I think is needed to reflect it is the whole area of automation, AI, digitalization. It doesn't have its own goal, but I know that there has been, of course, many, many discussions going into the SDGs, and it is a world governmental program that, if implemented rightly, we put the planet on a sustainable path. I believe that the whole technological side of things has to be enshrined in many of them. There is no single goal for it. I do believe that everyone who is sitting in this room will still see many iterations of technology advancements and therefore it merits particular attention. But then you know there are groups who say there should be a particular goal on youth because we are focused right now on the biggest generation of youth that is, has ever existed on the planet, the 1.8 billion. Why is there no specific SDG? Is it mainstreamed in all of them? There are others that argue if we fulfill all of the SDGs then actually we are counteracting ourselves because if we provide health care to everyone we are not guaranteeing that the planet will be sustainable because everyone would survive we have overpopulation already and there are certain ecological boundaries that we need to observe the SDGs are the best humankind could come up with it's 193 states that agreed to them in 2015 are they flawless no are there finally KPIs so are we tracking, are we measuring, are we seeing progress? Yes. Is it too little? Is funding too little? Unfortunately, yeah. What will come after 2030? It has an expiration date. We need to involve in the debate already now what we need to retain, what we need to change, what needs to become a separate goal, which ones should probably be fused also with the knowledge that we have gathered now. But that doesn't mean that we should let loose on trying to implement the, the consensus of the world right now. That's the best I can say. Thank you very much for your answer. I also have another question to um, Ms. Barbara. Um, so I was wondering how do you approach people who get discriminated because I feel like it's a very traumatizing event and many people don't even know that there is, um, there, there is somewhere that they can go to and, and report and even when, while reporting, it's still kind of like re-traumatizing the whole experience. And I was just wondering, how do you approach these, these groups? Um, well, of course, it is, um, it is a decision by the persons themselves that they turn to our organization. And um, our organization is quite present in traditional media. Um, we, of course, also have our uh, social uh, media channels and we also participate in all kinds of different events and we are also part of different networks and we cooperate with community organizations. So that's how we reach out. And um, what we can observe is that many people that turn to us have really a long history of experiencing racism and um, they turn to us after a very long time. And sometimes um, it is a very traumatizing event and then uh, people, people turn to us. And we, of course, when we have uh, personal counseling, our, our counselors um, take this, this situation into account. And, and first of all, we, we always act in the interest of, of our clients. So 
um, if uh, the clients come to us and say, well, I only want to talk about what I experienced and you can document it, but I am not willing to go any further and think about um, any strategies how to deal with it, th that's fine. And um, if the client says, well, uh, what options do I have? Do I have legal options? Um, what other options do I have if, if there aren't any legal options? Um, then we try to explain these options. Um, and um, it is, um, of course, also sometimes uh, difficult if you explain, well, you can turn to the police or um, there is a legal issue there, um, you might, might turn to a court. Um, people are sometimes um, are not very um, trustful in these institutions because they have already experienced um, racism from these institutions as well. So we also accompany them, um, for instance, if they want to um, make a report uh, to the police, then, then we accompany them uh, to the police. And um, so we, we, we try to make uh, this situation as comfortable as possible, but of course we are, we are aware uh, that it is, it is of course re-traumatizing for, for our clients. Thank you very much for your answers. Okay, thank you. I would like to build actually on your previous question and, and the answer about uh, the, the future, 2030, and also on uh, what uh, Jürgen was saying at the start. Um, what's happened in the last five years, more or less, what we have seen. Um, now we hear a lot of wonderful programs, ideas, strategies, actions, etc., etc. But haven't we noticed that as soon as there's a crisis and there is insecurity, there's a huge backlash, which we have witnessed, and we are going back in all these wonderful uh, ideas and projects, etc. And, and uh, there, as somebody, there is more racism uh, because of, of uh, insecurity, because of uh, uh, insecurity, by, be they financial or whatever it is. Uh, the backlash for women has been extreme in this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. And even technology, because you were saying technology is the future, etc. But we have research, and, and it is, is doing this kind of research here, that digitalization has actually created backlash for women in the COVID times. So, you know, is all this not a bit fragile? You know, how much can we achieve? How much can we do if at the... Uh, at the first crisis, we closed the borders between European countries, and, and, and this was unthinkable. And we, we come back to situations that we could not even imagine we would come back to in Europe. And this is happening now again and again and again. And with this latest crisis, you see it again. The racism, the insecurity, the, uh, the discrimination, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I, I was wondering, you know, are we... Is it like, uh, the, as we say, the profession of Echternach is two steps forward, one step back? Are we really moving on, or is it too fragile, and we, will it not survive the next crisis? This is a general question. Can I respond without answering? Please. <laughs> we were tasked as well in one of our homeworks, what are the biggest challenges? And what you stipulated right now is, is quite in the line of that. So. When we are confronted with crisis, aren't we like completely stepping back? And I believe a key would be for exactly our themes. Inclusion, inclusion is important. Openness to inclusion is the key to unlock it. And in the case of equity, I truly believe that we need justice in equity. So the chance lies in justice for equity. And for diversity, I think it lies in unity. Why do I say this? The climate crisis we will only be able to solve in unity and we will only be able to do it even in COVID to have everyone safe if we have an equitable system of vaccination distribution, medical distribution, collaboration of countries. So yes there is backlash but we know the methods of how to get to the opportunity and I think particularly business students when they are looking at what can be my job in the future they should look at the bigger the problem, the bigger the business opportunity. 
and the bigger the entrepreneurial mindset can be to, to be applied to that. Technology is a means, is a tool. But imagine Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, if that process of even peace negotiations, they are not yet taking place. But imagine that process of people getting together would be more inclusive, meaning women who are currently fleeing in the Ukraine and, and children are involved and around the table. Meaning that in Russia, a journalist that is holding up a sign saying a war is going on, risking her own family life and risking 15 years, I think, is now is, is up in, in question. They would be included in negotiations around how these countries should live, hopefully, side by side. It would be better. There is a massive opportunity in inclusion. There is a massive opportunity in that. Mm. And I want to stay hopeful that technology can aid inclusion and technology can aid equity and technology can aid diversity. Technology is also excluding a lot of people. Let's use it rather as a force for the good than mm. exclusion. Any other um, reactions? Um, yes, please. Yes, I mean, I, always this, uh, this uh, conversation around technology is very interesting because I think, you know, technology can be used as a double-edged sword, mm. obviously. It can be used to uh, commit uh, crime. It could be used also as a, uh, to leverage, actually. How can we leverage the advancements of information technology for sustainable development? And I think... Uh, um, there is obviously the digital gap that's also evident um, when, it, when we come to that. But um, I think a, a big part of the future also lays in technology. I mean, how could we leverage it? How could we leverage all of this? Uh, also, thinking about youth. I mean, um, I've, I've traveled to so many countries and it would be, um, I mean, in, in rural areas, but you would still find a telephone, you would still find a mobile, yeah. you would still find a connection. And all of these areas of innovation around technology and how we could also reach rural, tech, rural areas as well when we're implementing projects on the ground, it's still also there's a lot of potential as well. But at the same time also there is, like I said, it's a double-edged sword and it's mm. a very interesting um, discussion. And, and, and for us it's a lot of also how can we, because of course, where I work, we also deal with the issue of cybercrime, we deal also with, uh, with uh, basically, you know, um, digital evidence and all of these things when it comes to technology. But at the same time, what we are really also committed to is showing how can we leverage these technologies also for learning, for sustainable development, uh, for implementing projects and also while thinking of addressing the digital gap. So just a, a small anecdote there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, we, and now I have to speak on, on behalf of the, of the Boltzmann Institute um, I'm, I'm working for because together with a colleague I did a study for the Austrian Ombud for Equal Treatment and we looked um, at companies that established diversity policies and strategies prior to the pandemic and um, which also already had some idea about resilience. And um, we, we did some interviews and, and two focus group discussions and, and the companies that participated in, in, in this research were of course companies that were not hit very hard uh, by, the, by the pandemic. But um, what you could really see is that those companies that were prepared as they had already established um, strategies for diversity and inclusion, that they were much more aware of um, needs of their staff members and um, of coming up with supportive measures. Because as you said, of course, um, digitalization and all these online tools um, also um, include barriers, for instance, for people with disabilities. But uh, those companies that were aware of diversity issues, they were much quicker in 
in coming up uh, with, with measure, measures supporting people. And they also said, well, uh, there are older people that are not so well acquainted with, with these tools mm -hmm. and uh, there are different areas of work um, because there, there are people that are sitting at home um, who are facing other issues, but there are also people um, that have to come to work every day because uh, they, you, uh, they, they work in, uh, in the production line. So um, they also thought about how can we um, include these people into, into this, this online world. And um, for, for companies that work at an international level, it was also um, more inclusive because they managed to integrate people from different countries which could never participate in, in, in physical meetings uh, before. And uh, so many more perspectives from, from many countries became, became visible and maybe also changed some perspectives at the headquarters. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there is also a great, a great potential there. But um, I think once again, we, we have to keep in mind that um, this of course works within uh, certain setups of companies. Um, and um, the question is how does it also translate into the private life um, mm -hmm. of, 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 of the people? And there we, of course, see all these negative uh, impacts that, um, that women um, have to take um, or have to work much harder because still mm -hmm. they have to do, they have to work at home and still uh, take care of, of, of their kids. Um, so I think it is, it is an, an ambivalent uh, development in, in, some, in, in some settings. Uh, we see quite the positive impact of, of, of these uh, diversity measures and uh, quite a lot of awareness, but um, it doesn't trickle down to, mm, yeah. to all the areas, so. No. Yes, uh, thank you. I think we could uh, talk another four hours, but uh, we, can, uh, we cannot uh, do that to our audience. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, at this point we can uh, close it down, but from our side, from uh, the management department, uh, Marie-Therese and I, we really want to thank you all, uh, yes. all five of you, and we really hope to keep the discussion open. So we know that there have been emails going around, but also we hope from the audience if there are yes. further questions um, that this debate goes on. So that is really, uh, I think, a main takeaway for today. Uh, the topic is very broad, the, the topic is very interdisciplinary, and we hope with this event that we put it again a bit more on the agenda uh, for ourselves, for students, for uh, future employers, employees uh, to work on this. So thank you very much and I hope you join me in thanking uh, the five speakers. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.